Hi guys, welcome to the new school year. Uh, this year for our confirmation class, we're going to be primarily focusing on the New Testament. We're going to start uh, you know, from Jesus' birth and, and go on actually all the way through Revelation. Obviously not covering everything, but hitting the highlights. However, for these first few classes uh, that, that we're back now after summer break, um, we're actually going to hit up the very end of the Old Testament. We, we got uh, pretty far into the Old Testament last year, but I wanted to just kind of start out by these, these first four or five lessons, um, kind of wrapping up the Old Testament, and, and then we'll get into the New Testament starting in October. So today, uh, and, and every day of class, uh, we're going to be using our green Growing in the Word textbook. That's going to be the, uh, the basis for our studies this year. So every week when you come to class, uh, you can bring that with you. Um, obviously, if you're just watching at home like you are today, just make sure that you have that with you so that you can go through it um, while we're going through this lesson together. So today we're going to start with, with lesson 30. That's where we're going to start uh, for this school year. Uh, that's on page 110 in your green book. So again, lesson 30, uh, page 110. Uh, before we actually get into the lesson though today, I just kind of wanted to, to recap kind of an overall flow of the Old Testament from creation up to where we are right now, just to kind of refresh your memories after after last year. Um, I, I did this on, on Wednesday as well when we met in person. So just to kind of get you up to speed again, you know, obviously last year, you know, we started with creation, you know, that this entire universe uh, came from God himself creating it by nothing more than his word, nothing less than his word. And uh, that's how this entire universe came to be. That's how uh, humankind, mankind came to be. And then as we moved on from those early chapters of Genesis, then the next major event in the Bible, of course, is Noah and the flood. And we see, of course, how God continued to keep his promise of the Savior alive through the way that he spared Noah and his family, and it would uh, that the promise would continue on, even though God destroyed everything else in the flood. Then the uh, really the next major event and and person that we encounter in the Old Testament in the Book of Genesis once again is Abraham, and Abraham lived about twenty one hundred years before Jesus came. Um, once again, God reiterated His promises that the Savior would come, and that He would come specifically through Abraham's descendants. Um, and then you move further, further down the timeline, of course, uh, Abraham's uh, it'd be great grandson, Joseph, uh, he, he went down to Egypt, was sold as a slave there by his brothers. And then eventually many of, or, you know, Abraham's descendants, Joseph's brothers and, and Joseph's father, and then their descendants after them, they ended up living in Egypt for a while and, and they became slaves. In fact, after a couple of generations, and, and so the, uh, those descendants of Abraham, which became known as the Israelites or the children of Israel, uh, they lived in slavery in Egypt for about 400 years before God delivered them from their slavery and finally brought them to the promised land where they eventually settled. Then uh, just remembering back to last year, you might remember that uh, when they got to the promised land, they didn't have a king right away. In fact, there were several hundred years that passed by uh, that were called the time of the judges, uh, when God sent leaders to kind of guide his people, but they weren't really kings per se. And so there was this period of time, about 300 years again, where, uh, where the Israelites had leaders called judges, but did not have a king. Finally, God gave the Israelites, um, you know, they, they were, they kept pestering God, give us a king, give us a king. So God finally allowed them to have a king. The first one was King Saul, who started out good, but didn't end up so well. Uh, the next one after Saul, which was probably the best known king of Israel in the Old Testament and also probably the most godly of any of the kings, even though he certainly had his imperfections as well, his sins also, but that was King David. Um, so King David, he lived roughly 1,000 years-ish before Jesus was born. If you're looking at, uh, if you got Lesson 30 open in your book, they got a timeline in there, and, and you can see David becomes king just a little bit before 1000 BC. And I think it's just kind of good to have a you know, at least a, a general understanding of the timeline um, to picture these these events as they take place. So King David was king. 
His, Sol his son after him became king. Then later, his son was Solomon. And unfortunately, after Solomon, then uh, again, we learned last year that the kingdom was divided into two. Um, that it became a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. There was kind of a civil war within. Uh, and along with the civil war, there were other problems too, namely that uh, a lot of the Israelites, including, uh, including many of the kings after Solomon, um, started worshiping other gods. And so, so after the kingdom divided in two, um, then you had, you know, you had a separate king in the, in the north, and a separate king in the south. And God sent a number of prophets along, along the way uh, to warn the people about their sinfulness, to warn them of the fact that, you know, they were worshiping false gods and they weren't serving the true God. And so the first major consequence of that was that God allowed the northern kingdom uh, to be invaded by the Assyrian army in the 700s B.C., and Basically, the northern kingdom ceased to exist after that. The, the, many of the people were taken captive, and they were kind of just dispersed throughout the Middle East, basically. And then about 150 years later, a little less than 150 years later, uh, basically the same type of thing happened uh, to the southern kingdom. So the southern kingdom, that was where Jerusalem was, that was where Bethlehem was. And uh, so a little bit before the year 600 B.C., uh, God allowed the uh, the southern kingdom to be taken captive. Also, they were they were uh, ransacked by the Babylonian kingdom. Uh, king Nebuchadnezzar was the king's name, and for a period of about seventy years, uh, many of the Israelites were living in exile in the land called Babylon. And so that sets up where we are today. As, as we get into Lesson 30 today, it takes us right into the middle of that, that Babylonian captivity. Um, you see noted there at the top of your page underneath the, the title of today's lesson where it says, Exile in Babylon, the Fiery Furnace, and the Lion's Den. Uh, it shows that the, the rough dates of this Babylonian captivity of the Israelites were about 604 B.C., so 604 years before Christ, until about 536 years before Christ. So again, a period of roughly 70 years that uh, many Israelites lived in captivity in the land of Babylon rather than in their homeland of Israel. Uh, and uh, eventually some of them were returned to their homeland. We'll get, in that, get into that in the following lessons. But uh, today we're, we're just going to focus on the first part of this lesson. So we're just going to look at the fiery furnace, um, Daniel chapter 3 verses 1 to 30. Uh, we're going to save Daniel and the lion's den. Uh, until until the next lesson, so next week. So this just kind of gives us a picture as, as to some of the stuff that was going on in Babylon and, and some of the ways um, that, uh, that, that God's people lived, some of the ways that they were affected, uh, some of the things that they experienced while they were living in captivity in the land of Babylon. So again, that, that just kind of brings us up to speed <laughs> very, very quickly. Um, whole <laughs> quick overview of the Old Testament leading up till now, the Babylonian captivity. And so I'm just going to read to you the, uh, the little introduction paragraph on the top of page 110 in your green book. And it says this. It says, God's people were living in a foreign land. The Babylonian army had taken them from their homes in the southern kingdom of Judah to live in exile in Babylon. God made this happen because of the people's unfaithfulness to him. During this time, their dedication to God was tested. But God took care of those who trusted in him. Even as he chastised them for their unfaithfulness, God remained faithful to his promises. And that's really a key thought that we'll, we'll take out of this, that even though, yes, God did allow the Israelite people to be invaded and taken into captivity because of their sinfulness, uh, because of their persistent rejection of him, um, yet God did not forsake his promises. Even in the midst of all this, even through all of this, God still continued to keep his promise of the Savior alive and did, in fact, fulfill the promise of the Savior, again, about 600 years later. And also, I should note in all of this, God did preserve a remnant of faithful, faithful believers as well. Uh, not all of those Israelites that got taken into captivity were necessarily unbelievers. In fact, we'll, we'll encounter 
several of them in today's lesson that were faithful to the true God. And uh, the reason they got taken captive, taken captive along with the rest of them was not because God was angry or upset with them. It was just part of being being a part of this this whole uh, this whole time in Israel's history. Um, God wasn't punishing them, um, and in fact, God preserved them in the midst of all this. And also, God did continue to call to repentance uh, people who had rejected Him. And there were no doubt a number of Israelites who, because of what happened, turned back to the true God. And so, again, we see God's faithfulness, we see God's grace and mercy in all of this, and ultimately the fact that he continued to promise the Savior to his people, and that that Savior would finally come. So today we're going we're gonna to hear specifically about a, a group of three guys. Uh, this, this story is probably familiar to you. Um, their names were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Abednego, and God rescued them from death in a fiery furnace. And so we, uh, we find this Bible count in Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 through 30. As I typically do when, when we do online classes like this, um, I'm just going to pause the video here. So I'm going to have you pause the video yourself. And you can find Daniel chapter 3 in your Bible. And I want you to read that uh, for yourself, Daniel chapter 3, 1 through 30. And then once you've finished reading that section of Scripture, then hit play again on the video and we will work through the questions together. All right, so now that you've finished your reading, uh, just to summarize real quick, again, King Nebuchadnezzar had built a giant golden idol uh, that was 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide, so that was a, a very tall statue. And uh, he had commanded all the people in the land, uh, no matter what their background was, what their religion was, uh, to bow down and worship this idol. And uh, like you see on page 110, right before the actual questions, there's two bullet points there that just kind of summarize it. And it says, three faithful followers of God were tested when the king of Babylon built a giant idol. Because obviously they were worshipers of the true God and they, they didn't want to bow down to this thing. And then it says, regardless of the consequences, these men were determined to do what was right. So again, Nebuchadnezzar had uh, threatened death, uh, death in a fiery furnace, to anybody who refused to bow down to this giant golden idol. And, and yet, uh, these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, um, they recognized that staying faithful to the true God was more important even than their own lives, uh, which they, they knew they would lose um, if, if they refused to listen to the king's orders. So, with that, uh, we'll, we'll get then into the questions. Um, how, how we'll do it is I'll, I'll read the question, and I'll just basically answer it right away. Um, maybe a good way for you to handle it is, you know, I read the question and then maybe you can pause the video and try to answer it for yourself first, write down your answer and then hit play and match up your answer with mine. And, and if there's any corrections to make, um, then you can do that. But I'm just going to go kind of straight through. Uh, I might make some extra comments along the way with these questions also, just to help us uh, absorb this all and, and uh, get the full picture here. So question number one, says, after he built a giant statue of gold, what did Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, command his people to do? So again, like we said, Nebuchadnezzar's command was that everybody needed to bow down to this idol. Uh, whenever the, the music was played, there was, there was going to be a musical cue. All these different instruments were going to play. And when that happened, that was the signal that they were all supposed to bow down and worship this big, tall, golden idol. Okay, so that is number one. Question number two asks, why was this a problem for the Jewish people living in exile in Babylon? And it says, review the first commandment printed below. So we'll, we'll read the first commandment real quick. Uh, the first commandment says, you shall have no other gods. And then Martin Luther asks, what does this mean? And he says, we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. So as we take the first commandment into account, the very first command that God gave to all of us, well, the, the reason that there was a problem for the Jewish people living in Babylon was because this would be a direct violation of the first commandment if they bowed down to this idol. This would be worshiping something other than the true God. And so that, that's your answer for question number two. Why was this a problem for the Jewish people living in exile in Babylon? Babylon. 
well, obviously God had commanded them to worship him and worship him alone. And now they were confronted with this dilemma that the king, the king of Babylon, was telling them to worship this false god, to worship this idol. So a uh, definite conflict right there. All right, so that's number two. Going on to number three. If the people didn't obey the king, what would happen to them? And like we read, uh, the king was preparing a fiery furnace, and he said that anybody who did not obey him would be thrown into this fiery furnace and killed. So simple answer, they would be killed in a fiery furnace. Question number four. How did most people respond to the king's command? Well, it, it said in verse 7 that pretty much everybody bowed down to it, right? Uh, in, in verse 7 it says, Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So, um, you know, we, we don't know exactly how many people there were. It sounds like it was a huge, huge crowd of people. Um, whatever the case, uh, pretty much all of them uh, listened to what the king had said, and they bowed down and, and worshipped. So we did hear, of course, that Shadrach, Meshach, and Bendigo did not. Uh, they were some of the few that, that did not. In fact, maybe they were the only ones that did not. And... Uh, now, just a, just an extra little comment here. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that all the other Israelites who were captive in Babylon, uh, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that when they bowed down to this idol, they had forsaken the true God and, and they were no longer worshipers of the true God. But uh, certainly they did sin in, in the fact, you know, that, I mean, you know, imagine one of us being there, you know, would we have the strength, the, the, the courage to stand up against the king's command, or would we go right along with them? You know, I, I would hope that we would have the courage and strength that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did, the, the faithfulness to the true God. Um, but unfortunately, because of our sinful nature, we may very well have bowed down, bowed down right along with them. And, uh, you know, thankfully, many of those Israelites probably recognized the error of their ways afterwards and, and repented, you know, confessed their sin to God and, and received his forgiveness. Um, but it, it's just good to think about uh, this in, in all of this, that, you know, there probably were some true, faith, true Israelites or true, um, true believers who, who succumbed to their sinful nature in this time and, and sought out God's forgiveness later. But uh, thanks be to God, there were men like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who boldly stood up for their faith and who did not bow down to this idol. So again, just a, a simple answer to question number four, how did most people respond to the king's command? Most people obeyed the king's command. Most people uh, did not obey the commandment that God had given to not have any other gods, but instead they were afraid of being killed, and so they listened to the king in this case. Question number five, what was the right thing for these believers to do in this situation? Uh, and it says, compare Acts 5 verse 29 with the fourth commandment. All right, so... Um, just answering that quickly, even before we look at those, I mean, you, you probably understand that, you know, the right thing for those believers to do would have been to disobey the king, right? To not bow down to this idol. And it says they'll compare this to Acts chapter 5, 29, and also the fourth commandment below. All right, so first of all, Acts chapter 5, verse 29, uh, the apostle Peter is talking to a group of people and he says, we must obey God rather than men. So that's a very important principle for us to remember. Um, reading the fourth commandment right below, it says, Honor your father and mother, that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. And then Martin Luther asks, what does this mean? And then he responds, We should fear and love God, that we do not dishonor or anger our parents and others in authority, but honor, serve, and obey them, and give them love and respect. All right, so as, as believers, as, as Christians, there are times where, you know, we, we have to wrestle with this issue. And uh, the, the believers um, that lived in Babylon at Daniel's time uh, needed to wrestle with this issue. So on the one hand, we have the command from God himself to honor our father and mother. And as, as Luther explains um, from Scripture, 
that this really applies more than to just our, our father and mother that we're supposed to honor and respect. But God does give us the command to honor all those who are placed in authority over us. So whether it's a king or a president or governor, law enforcement, you know, whatever the case might be, those that are placed in a position of authority over us, in general, we are supposed to honor and respect. And yet, at the same time, we have what Peter tells us in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, and he says, we must obey God rather than men. So, all that put together, you know, again, that, that helps us come up with our answer for number five here. What was the right thing for these believers to do in this situation? And obviously, it was, it was to obey God rather than men. So yes, on the one hand, God does tell us to obey the earthly authorities that are placed over us. In general, you know, the Israelites were supposed to obey the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, um, even though, you know, he, he was, you know, he had taken them into captivity, and yet for that time that they were in captivity in Babylon, he was essentially their king also. Um, so in general, they were supposed to obey him. But in this case, he had commanded them to do something that went against God's word, something that went against God's command, and therefore, in a situation like that, God would give uh, his full permission to disobey the king. So that was, you know, the right thing for the believers to do in this situation would have been to disobey the king. Obviously, many people still obeyed the king because they were afraid, but the right thing to do would have been to disobey the king and instead to obey God, who had given the commandment, you shall have no other gods. All right. Moving on to number six. Some people accused three of God's people, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, of disobeying the king. What positions did these men have in the kingdom? And it says to see verse 12 of Daniel chapter 3 and also uh, chapter 2 verses, verse 49 of Daniel. So first of all, chapter 3 verse 12 says, um, But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. So there it mentions that uh, they were... Um, Jews who had been set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. So they, they held government positions. Um, chapter 2, verse 49 basically says the same thing. It says, Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while that Daniel himself remained at the royal court. So uh, so Daniel himself, the one who uh, whom this, this book of prophecy is named after, um, Daniel was an Israelite who was uh, welcomed as, as one of the advisors in the king's court. And Daniel was the one who had recommended Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the king to serve in his government. So it's kind of interesting that um, even though the Israelites were in captivity in Babylon, yet the king actually did uh, invite some of those Israelites uh, to take part in his government. So, uh, again, we, we don't know the specific positions that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had. Uh, it just calls them administrators uh, in the province of Babylon. So, uh, so what positions did these men have in the kingdom? Uh, we would just say that they were administrators, or they, they were government officials in the kingdom of Babylon. That would be the answer to number six. Question number seven says, What did Nebuchadnezzar do in response to the accusations? And verse 15, it points us to, uh, it says, Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? So basically, King Nebuchadnezzar gave them a, a second chance. You know, those... Those other people reported Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the king and said, hey, look, they're, they're not bowing down. They're not obeying your command. And King Nebuchadnezzar gave him a second chance. He summoned them to him, the scripture account tells us, and he says, I'm going to give you another chance to bow down. You know, when you hear the music, you better bow down to that idol. And then once again, he reiterates his threat too. you know, if you don't, you are going to be thrown into that fiery furnace. And he says, what God is going to be able to save you from that? ironically enough, 
<laughs> he would soon find out. But uh, that, that was Nebuchadnezzar's response. He gave them a second chance, but he told them, if you don't listen this time, if you don't obey this time, you are definitely being thrown into the furnace. Question number eight. As they stood their ground and refused to worship the statue, how sure were these three men that God would save them from the fiery furnace? And this is a remarkable demonstration of their faith. You know, they, they say the God that we serve is able to save us. Uh, verses 17 and 18, which it points us to there, says, If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O, o King. Excuse me. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O King, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. So again, just an awesome demonstration of their faith, their, their trust in God, that whether they lived or whether they died, God would be with them and he would bless them and he would take care of them. Um, you know, they, 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 on the one hand, they said, you know, if, if God desires, he can rescue us from this fire. And what they meant by that, obviously, was that he could preserve their lives. He could cause them to not get harmed from the fiery furnace and, and bring them right on out. They were confident that God could do that if it was his will. At the same time, they expressed the reality that, you know, maybe it's not God's will to save us in a, a physical way or a temporal way from this fire. You know, maybe God will allow us to die. But at the same time, they had the confidence in God that even if they died, that would mean heaven for them. I mean, if, if they died in this fiery furnace as a result of being faithful to God, there was nothing for them to worry about because the moment they died, God would take them to heaven. So they knew that, again, whether they lived or whether they died, all would be good. Whether they lived or whether they died, God was with them and God would save them in one way or another, whether it was preserving their physical life here on this world for a while yet or preserving them for eternity by taking them to heaven. So as they stood their ground, again, just reiterating number eight, as they stood their ground and refused to worship the statue, how sure were these men that God would save them from the fiery furnace? They were sure. They were confident one way or another, whether it was through preserving their life or whether it was by allowing them to die and taking them safely to heaven. They were sure God would save them. Question number nine. What happened when the three men were thrown into the blazing hot furnace? Uh, again, we heard that suddenly, you know, the king looked up and, and the advisors looked up and they, they saw there was a fourth person in the fire with them and, and it looked like a son of the gods, they said. Um, and so what happened was that God preserved them. God didn't allow them to get hurt. He didn't even allow the smell of smoke to be on their clothes. Um, God kept them totally safe in that fiery furnace. And uh, as, as that angel of the Lord, that, that messenger of God, stood there right with them, uh, which some speculate was even uh, what we would call the pre-incarnate Christ, so Jesus before he became born into this world, um, God preserved them and, and God sent this special messenger, this angel, to stand right there with them uh, as, as testimony to them and to God, you know, to, to them to, um, as their protection and also as a testimony to all those who were watching of God's power and his faithfulness. So what happened? Um, the three men were thrown into the fiery furnace. This is answering number nine now. They were thrown in, but God spared them. He didn't allow them to get hurt. And he sent, uh, he sent an angel of the Lord or, or a, a divine messenger to stand there right with them. Uh, number 10. Why do you suppose God protected them in this way? And it says, note Nebuchadnezzar's reaction in verses 28 to 29. So let's read 28 to 29 again. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. And that is an awesome, awesome testimony or demonstration of why, why do you suppose God protected them in this way? Because it was a powerful testimony to who God is and that he is the only true God. 
that Nebuchadnezzar and his advisors that were standing there with them or with him, um, they saw all this take place, and it led them, uh, particularly Nebuchadnezzar, to give glory to the true God. And, and what an awesome, awesome thing that is, um, you know. Now, you know, we're we're not sure. Uh, we're not sure that uh, Nebuchadnezzar himself didn't drift back into idolatry. Uh, there, there are things that we know from history that that seem that you know he may have still worshipped other other gods too, false gods along with the true God. But uh, as as somebody asked me in our class on Wednesday, you know, is Nebuchadnezzar in heaven? Um, I would at least open the door, or I would at least leave the door open to the possibility that he is, uh, because even though there there are things that maybe seem to indicate that he kind of worshipped God as just one of a number of gods, um, yet there are also things that Scripture records that maybe indicate that he was in fact a, a true believer, um, that that he did abandon his idolatry and and worship the Lord and recognize him as true God. So. Uh, is Nebuchadnezzar in heaven? It's possible. <laughs> that's that's all I can say with certainty. Um, but it is possible, and and praise be to God that it's even possible. Praise be to God that uh, you know He gave this demonstration of who He is, um, and, and led Nebuchadnezzar at least in this moment um, to give glory to the true God, the God of the Bible, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, question number eleven. This is kind of an application question now for us. You may not be compelled to bow down to a false god, but in what ways are you pressured to ignore God's commands? Uh, and obviously, that, that's a really wide open question. I mean, if, if you want to think specifically about the first commandment and, and worshiping other gods, you know, there's there's all sorts of things that, that the devil and our own sinful flesh uh, put into our life that, that pull us away from God. That, that, that uh, you know, it, it's not that we necessarily cease to acknowledge God as, as the true God, and it's not that we necessarily cease to recognize Jesus as our Savior, but yet there are any number of things in our life that, that kind of uh, fight for our devotion to God, where, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe we're tempted to devote a lot of our time and attention to things that maybe aren't ultimately so important. Um, whether they're sports or, or leisure, someday maybe our, our jobs or, you know, focusing so much on finances. You know, these are these are just some of the things that, that can gradually pull us away from God. You know, it's not that we can't enjoy those things and be worshipers of the true God at the same time. I mean, we certainly we can enjoy sports. We can enjoy leisure. We can be thankful for the jobs that God gives us. We can be careful with our money. Um, but what, what we want to be careful with is that those things don't ultimately start taking over our hearts and, and causing us to, you know, to, to really ultimately honor those things, worship those things more than we worship the true God. That, that we don't see those things become to see, the, that, we, that we don't start to see those things ultimately as, as being more important, more worthy of our devotion and attention uh, than our devotion and our attention to the true God. So those are, those are things that we have to wrestle with as Christians. And those are things that we all, you know, we've all fallen, fallen short in those ways. We've all sinned in those ways. And we come back to God in repentance. Just like I said, you know, there were no doubt Israelites who, you know, did believe in the true God and, and yet still sinned in this time that they bowed down to this false idol. Um, there are times when we as Christians who, you know, we, we fully believe in Jesus as our Savior and yet we still find ourselves wrestling with our priorities or, or bowing, so to speak, bowing down to false gods. And again, what I mean by that is prioritizing other things or glorifying other things, um, giving more devotion in our life to other things than, than to Jesus. And so as with all our sins, we, we repent before God of that. We ask him to forgive us and, and we are confident that he does forgive us. And, and this, knowing his forgiveness is what drives us back to him over and over again and, and remembering, Jesus, you are the most important thing in my life and there is nothing so worthy of my time and attention and devotion than you yourself. And Lord, please keep me close to you and faithful to you my whole life long. That, that's the prayer that he leads us um, to bring to him on a daily basis. Uh, along with that too, again, just, you know, uh, thinking of this question, you know, it asks, what other ways are we pressured to ignore God's commands? Obviously, there's there's a whole bunch of other commandments that God gives us also, 
um, everything from you know stealing to sexual immorality to murder and and harming harming other people, lying you know all kinds of things like these. These are all entailed in God's commandments, and obviously there are many many different ways that we are pressured to break these commandments. Um, whether it's just simply from the desires of our own sinful nature, or whether it might be peer pressure from friends who are you know tempting us to do something or you know trying to persuade us to do something that, that we know is wrong. Um, there's an endless amount of ways that, that we're pressured to break God's commandments. And once again, we do in fact find ourselves breaking God's commandments over and over. Not a single one of us is perfect. That doesn't give us an excuse. And, you know, that doesn't mean that, okay, since I'm not perfect, I can just go ahead and break whatever commandments I, I feel like. Um, but yet at the same time, we have we have this, you know, this comfort of knowing that, yes, even though I have in my sinfulness broken God's commandments, I've, I've succumbed to peer pressure, I've done things that I know I wasn't supposed to do. Um, yet as we continue to come back to our merciful Savior over and over and over again, asking his forgiveness and seeking his mercy, um, we know that he does forgive us. So, yes, we have been, we've, we've caved into pressure many times over and broken God's commands, and yet every time we come back to him repenting of our sin and asking his forgiveness, we can be 100% confident that all those sins, all those acts of disobedience on our part are washed away in the blood of Jesus. And that is an awesome, awesome thing. And that is really the truth that our faith is founded on. And that is, that's why we worship Jesus in the first place. So that is, uh, that's all for today. Like I said, we're going to save Daniel in the lion's den until next time. So uh, with that, um, we'll just close with a prayer. Uh, if you have any questions on anything or anything that you, you wanted to add to the discussion um, based on, on what we studied today, uh, by, by all means, please feel free to either save those questions until the next time that I see you in person or, you know, if you want to send me a, a message, um, that's fine too. So I'm happy to talk over any questions that you might still have or just address any comments that you might have in, in regard to this also. So uh, that is all for today and we're just going to close quick with a prayer. And then I'll let you go. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us your word, and we thank you for teaching us this account of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We praise you, Lord, for keeping them faithful to you, even in spite of the strong, strong temptation to, uh, to disobey you in this account. Um, we, we praise you also, Lord, that many other people were led to recognize your glory on account of their faithful testimony. We pray, Lord, that in all things you would help us to also give faithful testimony to you, that by our, by our life, by our actions, by our words, um, we would give clear testimony to your glory and that others may come to worship you as well. Please forgive us for all the times that we have fallen short and, and broken your law. And please continue to bring us, uh, to build us back up again by the powerful message of Jesus our Savior. We praise you and thank you all because of him. In his name we pray, amen. All right, just one last thing to add real quick. Um, our homework for next time is just simply to memorize the first commandment and the what does this mean. So you can find that on page 110 in your green book, the first commandment, and the what does this mean. That's the homework for next week. So thanks for tuning in, and uh, look forward to seeing you guys next time. Have a good day.